So now, time for the first actually like really, really starting. So I'm excited to just introduce our GDEs for this panel, for this club panel. Let's get them started. Uh, all of three of you working in the industry building very complex systems. Um, can you give us some examples uh, like you are currently working on? Uh, you know, why it is, uh, you know, in which matters it is complex and how the cloud uh, uh, helping the, uh, the project or the product you're working on? So I'll go ahead and start. So um, I build um, high performance data pipelines in support of bioinformatics research, generally, although I do all kinds of different cloud architectures. Um, so in those architectures, I'm working with Apache Spark at scale on, on GCP products like Dataproc um, and really trying to help my customers get um, speed for the research questions at scale. Um, and it's interesting, I did supportive cancer research, but then, you know, as COVID, you know, became a pandemic, I, my firm has been really, really busy because I had a lot of clients that had, you know, needs around um, uh, COVID, uh, you know, effect, uh, medicine effectiveness and stuff like that. So it's been um, interesting to see people accelerate to come onto the cloud faster because they had to, because for example, they have so much data, they just like ran out of space. So that's one thing. And then another one that I'm doing is I'm helping a company that it's been a startup. They're going to go out publicly and uh, it's, um, it's around um, compliance, so it's fintech. So literally, I was working on that this morning. So um, PCI compliance, um, always always a joy, right? To make sure everything's encrypted and protected. And so some, some really intense um, work around protecting the data um, uh, in, in depth, whether it's from encryption or whether it's from networking around VPC networks or whether it's around um, effective IAM, which is everybody's favorite topic, right? Everybody wants to do effective IAM. Let's 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 hear for permissions. I'm joking because <laughs> notoriously developers um, that's not their favorite subject, but it's really important. So a lot of DevOps this week. Yeah, so we work with a bunch of different companies that can you know, e-commerce sites to um, uh, ticketing systems to uh, IoT, right? And so all of these different companies have different needs, right? So some companies can just has have, just have high sustained loads all the time. Uh, some companies are very cyclical, right? And so like for the ticketing company example I mentioned, um, they could have very little traffic and then all of a sudden ticket sales open at noon on a particular day and then their infrastructure needs spike up, right? Because they have to be able to handle the load. Uh, and so um, cloud works really well for that. And so we have to be able to automate the cloud, right? Because the cloud itself is not automated. Uh, and so we Kubernetes, it's a great tool for us. Um, to be able to auto scale both the workloads and the infrastructure uh, uh, powering that workload. Um, yeah, and so that, that's like, you know, we are kind of a general purpose GCP shop um, and we use the most out of Kubernetes. Great. How about you, Ikra? Oh, I think you're, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Awesome. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, okay. We at Omni Labs, we are working towards bringing automation to everybody. And for us, cloud ends up being one tool of other things that we do. So we sit at the intersection of cloud, web, and machine learning, where we are trying to uh, help automate everybody's workflows that they are doing every day on their browsers and things like that. Uh, so for us, it's like we are doing a lot of things, but we are trying to keep almost everything serverless. Of course, we are a small company right now. We don't want to overload a lot of those tasks on our side. So we dive everything on serverless from serverless compute to serverless machine learning, data processing, everything that needs, that can be serverless, we move it to serverless side uh, so that we don't have to manage those and we can focus our energies towards actually doing the engineering task and doing product, building the product part. Yeah, um, we will we'll talk more about that as we go into the panel. Go for it, Bill. Okay, great. Uh, we all, I mean, all of these, uh, uh, project uh, sounds really exciting. So um, when um, Victor, you talk about uh, you know the, you're working on the Kubernetes, uh, and also you mentioned about uh, automate the DevOps for the customers. I think that's really uh, uh, you know important to solving many of the customers' their uh, daily uh, 
uh, uh, works uh, uh, problems they are working on. So uh, I I uh, I think as a Google Cloud GCP have uh, uh, called Google Kubernetes uh, engines. Um, do you kind of like, uh, tell a little bit more about that and uh, kind of like the benefits, uh, uh, you know, uh, relate to the Kubernetes running on the, on the cloud? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as people know, Kubernetes is a great way to manage distributed um, computing resources, right? So, um, you know, if you, if you go back a long time ago, when I first started putting uh, sites on the internet, um, I, I literally had to build a, uh, I built a 1U server in, you know, in my dorm room, installed Linux on it, con configured the networking stack and shipped it off to a data center and hoped that when they plugged it in and plugged in the ethernet port that I could ping it from remotely and that it was pre-configured correctly, right? And, um, and that was just one machine. So, you know, and, and, and you know, as things get more complex, like as we add more software components, and we exceed the load of a single machine, you know, we have to add more hardware to it. And in the past, you know, companies had to build data centers, they had to build all these racks, all these machines. And configuring all that is actually really hard and uh, uh, making sure that it all works. And so the whole, you know, uh, trend in computing and, and uh, online has been to abstract all of this com complexity away so that we can get hardware uh, distributed systems to uh, behave in a way that is manageable for like a single developer. Uh, and Kubernetes is currently the best tool that we have to do that, right? So uh, instead of having to know about uh, IP addresses of all these machines and Linux and networking, uh, I can just describe my workload uh, as a, a Docker image, um, some number of environment variables, uh, the resources that I need in terms of CPU and memory, and the number of copies of this app that I need, and Kubernetes takes care of making sure that the work gets scheduled on different pieces of hardware and makes sure that all the various processes can communicate with each other. Um, and it's really important, especially because now, you know, applications aren't monolithic anymore. They, we're, we've operated, you know, companies are building microservices that are a bunch of little things that can talk to each other. Um, and in the past, like just having, adding another service meant, meant configuring a load balancer and, like manually and having to know how to do that for all these different hardware vendors uh, is really hard. Uh, and so Kubernetes solves all these things. It, it, it's, you know, distributed systems is always going to be complex, but it makes it very easy for us to, to actually manage it from uh, um, as an engineer. Uh, and Kubernetes on GCP, being you know called GKE, uh, is just the gold standard of Kubernetes, right? So um, Google is doing a really good job of enhancing Kubernetes, uh, adding features that you can only do on GKE. Um, one example I have is um, like Kubernetes uh, uh, on autopilot, right? So, you know, the trend is making more and more things intelligent and uh, making the infrastructure more intelligent and kind of automate itself, right? So, um, in, in, you know, even just like a year ago, when I'm provisioning a Kubernetes cluster, uh, or a GKE cluster, I still had to do things like determine, um, based on my workload, the optimal instance sizes uh, and, and zones and everything else that goes into this, you know into a Kubernetes cluster. But now I can check a checkbox and say, here's my workload. Google and GKE is going to figure out uh, the optimal instance size, how to place it, and let it scale down to zero, scale up, you know, to my limits. Um, and it's just from a uh, engineer's perspective, uh, much easier for me to not have to worry about any of the plumbing and the underlying uh, bits of it. So that's why I, I'm a big fan of uh, GKE. So just to add on that, um, what's interesting about the maturing, maturing of the you know, GCP platform is the different offerings around containers. So while for some customers using GKE is a great fit, for example, the customer I'm working with now, they don't have any knowledge around containerization other than you know, kind of testing it in dev. And so what we've done when we refactor their application, because everybody wants to get rid of VMs, that's like a common theme, because we, we just don't want to manage at that level anymore, is we've used the Cloud Run service. And um, literally, we consider it a win when we can peel something off from a VM and get rid of that VM and run it on Cloud Run as kind of an intermediate point, because 
you know, um, we don't need the scaling for some of the services that would be provided by GKE. Um, and it's, it's like a simpler process if you don't know Kubernetes at all. So I've had, um, you know, this customer I'm on right now and a number of customers in the bioinformatics space try out Cloud Run as an intermediate measure. And that really, really um, was useful for them. I don't know if you, have you had that too, Vikram? Yeah, so uh, on our side, what we have seen is, at, first of all, like serverless is an abstraction. Like, of course, all things are running on servers somewhere, even if you are not managing it, someone else right. is managing it. Um, and what we have seen over time is, is like, at least from Cloud Run side, they have, uh, the team has worked a lot around making sure that you can run all types of workloads. Initially, when the abstraction was made, it couldn't run a lot of things that were running in background and things like that. So if we had like, on our side, we had some data processing pipelines which, which ran like for long times, which would run 40 minutes, 50 minutes. We wouldn't be able to run those on Cloud Run. Now they have with, I think the, it's called the second generation Cloud Run now. And with that, you can run up to 60 minutes on Cloud Run time on Cloud Run. So like those things are enabling us to do a lot of data workloads that we would need to spin up and like do all the data processing pipelines thing for. You don't need to do all those. So you can do all those on Cloud Run, which is, gives us the same API. You don't have to rebuild things. You don't have to relearn things about new concepts or let's say data flow or any other platforms. And you can just reuse the same things over and over again. Yeah, of course. Like, and, and I think like that's the same thing, like um, providing this wide variety of selection across on cloud to say like, which platform do you want to go with? How much time do you have to spend upon? How much energy do you have to spend on these different processes and optimizing those? Based upon that, you can just go forward and start using one of those uh, from GKE to cloud run to something else. And just because I yeah. see some comments in the chat, GKE is Google Kubernetes engine. So it's managed Kubernetes. So some of the lower lying um, management is provided by the Google Cloud platform as opposed to like open source Kubernetes. So sorry about that. We try not to use acronyms, but it's really hard in cloud because everything's an acronym. Um, in yeah. fact, there's this great resource that you guys um, that are watching, you can get it online. It's a sheet that basically takes every single Google Cloud service and uh, it tells what it is in English. And even I, who've been working with Google Cloud for like, I don't know how long, six years, however long it's been around, I have to kind of look sometimes because there's over 300 services. So uh, oh, somebody asked, what is what is GDE? So maybe we should talk about that, but I'll let somebody else talk about it. We're using too many acronyms. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks uh, Lee for the, you know, uh, for, for, for the explanations. Uh, yeah, GDE is uh, a Google developer uh, expert, and uh, it's a group of, uh, uh, you know, engineers. They are really, uh, you know, have a lot of experience on the uh, Google Cloud uh, technologies and uh, on the developing, deploy, deploy managing. So uh, I think there are a lot of other uh, resources. They have a website somewhere else. Probably later on we can post it into the chat so you can uh, take more on that. So, um, yeah, this sounds really exciting. and. Uh, uh, I, mean, I think nowadays we also talk about uh, serverless and uh, everybody want to their service running in cloud become a serverless mode. So uh, maybe this question is going to for all of you and uh, we can you know take the, any orders. So uh, how to kind of like migrate my applications, you know, it's re uh, this really looks exciting. So I want to get into, uh, get on my applications to cloud, get to the service. So how to get started on that? So what's kind of like a high level uh, process on that? Well, I'll kick it off really quick and then throw it over to the other guys. So in addition to Cloud Run, which is deploy your own containers, images, container instances, um, there is functions, which basically is just deploy your code. The difference is with Cloud Run, it's not every runtime. So if you have some obscure programming language like Dart, well, I shouldn't say that on a Google thing, but whatever, um, some, some language that's not as um, in, in the mainstream like Java or Python or something like that, it only, uh, Cloud Functions only works with certain runtimes. Um, that's in terms of compute, that's pure, pure serverless. Um, so you have like a menu from functions if your language is supported, Cloud Run if you need to bring your own container with your own language runtime or you need more control, and then you you know can go to different sort of levels of, of management and compute. In the data side, um, people never talk about files, but cloud storage is serverless. That's really important in my world because um, most of the data is files. Um, in the relational databases and the NoSQL databases, Google has 
in NoSQL, they have quite a bit of serverless um, where you just create the instance. In the relational databases, they do a lot of the management, a lot more than the other cloud vendors. So even in something like Spanner, which is massively scalable relational, uh, it's much quicker to set up um, because although you do have access at the database level, you don't have access at the operating system level as compared to some of the other cloud vendors. So it's kind of like hybrid for, depends on where you are for the data. And then there's a whole suite of services like CICD that are beautiful, that are completely serverless. I don't know about you guys, but I love getting rid of a build server. That makes me so happy when I can, and I'm actually building that with another customer. So I, clearly I love serverless. I think we all do. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of stop there and, and, and throw it over maybe to Victor. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, those are all great services, Lynn. Um, and, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, these are all really serverless, like even, you know, compute engine is serverless. I don't have to worry about a machine in a, in a rack, right? It's just an API from my perspective. Uh, but I think what most people are talking about when they say serverless is like, they're not having to worry about, um, uh, you know, Linux uh, and having to set up all the various networking bits, you know, because when you when you run a Docker image, if you're able to package up your application in a Docker image, uh, you get all of your dependencies in a Docker image, uh, you can just run a single G Cloud run command, Google figures out how with the machine to run it on, how much memory, how much CPU to give it, it gives it a publicly accessible URL, right? And, and so there's multitudes of things that have been automated just for you, right? Like that used to take, uh, you know, somebody very experienced hours to do, uh, get an IP address, configure the firewall, configure the load balancer, and all of a sudden now it just works. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that to me is like from a developer uh, productivity perspective, um, it is a game changer, right? Um, and and so in a couple of years ago, like Lynn said, uh, serverless, you know, we were limited to functions like very small, um, you know, from a code and a CPU pr resource perspective, runtime perspective, you couldn't run a function for, you know, more than 15, 30 minutes uh, and they have very little RAM. And, and so, the worlds are converging, right? Like, so uh, uh, Cloud Run is a great tool that takes, that gives you the speed and developer agility of something like Cloud Functions, but gives you the ability to run whatever you want. Like, as long as you can package it in a Docker image, you can make it run on Cloud Run. Uh, and then you still have some runtime uh, uh, limits, but uh, you know, Google, and this goes back to why GD or GKE, Google, Google Kubernetes, is such a great tool. Uh, with Cloud Run on GKE, you can now remove a lot of the limitations around resources because you can build, you have the exact same API that you have when you're deploying Cloud Run uh, uh, hosted by Google, but if you outgrow those for some the limits for some reason, you can run that on your own uh, GKE cluster, which gets rid of a lot of limits. Yeah, and I, I would like to add. Yeah, I would like to add some things in here. Like folks generally, when we are talking about serverless, they think about moving their existing non-serverless workloads to serverless, but they don't think about what are the other benefits that they might be getting. So, for example, on Google Cloud. Uh, if you are if you have an app that is run on Cloud Run, you buy inherently just by deploying it there, you get a lot of benefits. Of course, like scaling, scaling down the new URL, the end public endpoint, all those security stuff. All those things are there. But other things like tracing, so you can see how your API requests are, which API requests are taking a long time. You don't have to put any tooling around it. You just deploy your app and you get tracing. You get native logging in there. You can put those logs and uh, move those logs directly to BigQuery for like later usage. Um, I have built like sample services where it would, you can use Cloud Run as a server for your real time analytics. It will send uh, analytics events to your Cloud Run event, Cloud Run server. It would log those into uh, Cloud Serverless, Stack Driver logging. <laughs> I'm just confusing with all the terms. Uh, it logs everything to Stack Driver logging, then Stack Driver logging to BigQuery, and from BigQuery, you can train models on top of that. So, like all of this without having to ever think about a server. You just think about your code and all of those things are happening for you in the background and people 
like whenever generally we are talking about serverless we are talking about moving existing service to serverless but once you are on serverless you start seeing all these other possibilities that you haven't had so far and even like recently cloud run uh, allowed you to run up to 1000 concurrent connections on a single uh, container that means now i have an opportunity to optimize my code so that it can handle that many concurrent requests which you would generally not think about it at all like when you are running on a compute uh, platform kind of thing so it just like just remember that not only there's like one benefit of moving to the cloud but also there's like more, more opportunities that are unlocked after that that you, you don't again again you don't have to rethink about those problems from the scratch because they are always there you can just plug and connect and move forward well that's great so uh yeah we talk about the structural part like the kubernetes and the serverless uh let's move up a little bit on the application stacks so um and uh, i i think you know with uh, vikram uh, you are the uh, gd uh, and uh, also on the machine learning part so i uh, curious uh, uh, what like can you run any of the machine learning and service in the uh, in the cloud and how the uh, gcp uh, helping engineers on the uh, running uh, you know working on the machine learning uh, areas sure so uh, anytime we talk about machine learning i suggest people to start with machine learning apis like i have a, this workflow that you have to go through before you can actually start building your models so first of all think about whatever your problem is try to see if that can be solved with machine learning apis and it might be but there are also times that uh, you might lose like an example is like i have seen those sorters like some videos of those where industry sorters where they are sorting green apples from red apples yes of course machine learning can do that but when you're talking about an industry level sorter where it's like happening within milliseconds you're going to lose all that time on the latency part so yes the solution even the solution is there it might not work for you so think about first of all whether an existing api machine learning api will solve the problem if not let's move on to the next step which is auto ml auto ml is there where you can these are industry based models which are like of course other people are using people are using it but you can bring your own data to that model and train your own models on top of that i've had um, i've done multiple conferences and over the past few years where i've met people who have used those models to build their own models like somebody wanted to detect car types and they had a large data set of like cars of different from different angles and they just trained a, a auto ml model on top of that to detect one car from a different car type and you can do that they never had to write one single line of code just put all the data onto auto ml and it runs all those things for you build and gives you the best model out at this point let's say either you have a model or you have found that there's nothing in there so at this point if you have a model it gives you a good baseline that you can start building on top of if you don't have anything now you know that either you need to go into research to find out a good model for you or you need to look at like other resources so there's of course tensorflow hub and you can look at like cool cloud uh, ai hub where there might be some solutions posted around it but at this point is the point where you should start writing code so then uh, start with vertex ai notebooks where you can train your model write, write all the model code train them on gcp with set of the art graphic cards and of course you have tpus in there which are not available on any other cloud and like once you have done the whole training retraining loop you can set all of those with pipelines so that it automatically redoes that every time you get new data and it automatically identifies those it will automatically update it to the latest endpoints all of those things you never have to think a lot about servers themselves and all this is um, just start working on whatever you're trying to do so what i love about this is the from whole start to the end journey you never had to think a lot about servers you have to think about your problem and how to solve that problem of course there's still like a big chunk of things that you have to do towards data side of things and like 70% of your energy might be spent towards like building good data sets so you can have good models but at least on the machine learning side you don't have to think a lot about it So I'm going to just jump in there because I don't do as much just hardcore machine learning, but I do what I call ML ops, which is like DevOps, but for machine learning, building that pipeline, getting the data ready. The other thing is I really want to emphasize what Vikram said. I'm seeing the same thing in when you're using the Google Cloud Platform. Something to be aware of is you don't start by writing a model. Even a data scientist like Vikram doesn't start by writing a model. So it's really really important that there's a menu of services and at the very top the APIs and I saw somebody ask what that is it's like a vision API where you just give it some images and it goes okay I see a cat I see a dog like if that works it's an endpoint you just use that now that's not going to work for most of your scenarios because it's labels that that Google has provided but it might work 
And then the next layer down is that AutoML. And what happens in that is you provide the labeled data. So like, I can't remember the example you were telling, but I, I had one around real estate, like the property is rentable. So they scraped photos off of Zillow and they labeled it like one to five, like five is do the most work, one is it's ready for renting right now. And they fed that to AutoML and then then you pay for training hours. Again, you're not making a model there. It's a faster time to market using machine learning. If none of those things work, then you make a model. So that's super, super important because almost all my customers don't understand this is out there. Because um, I think like in the dedicated machine learning space, people are starting to get it. But like in sort of the bigger ecosystem, people still think they need to hire like, you know, a team of data scientists which you may or may not. I mean, honestly, what I find a lot of times I go out to the enterprise and they've hired like four or five data scientists like right out of university, maybe they're math majors, and they're actually really unhappy because they're cleaning the data because the data has to be properly prepared so that it can be put into some of these other tools. So the other thing that I want to emphasize is the amount of samples that Google has. I really got to say, because I work in all the different vendor clouds, I mean, the first thing that I will do if I'm going to have to write a, a model or work with a customer is like Vikram was saying, go to TensorFlow Hub. There's a whole bunch of work that's already been done and you can build on that rather than starting from scratch. And it has best practices in terms of scaling, which again is a, a real strength of the Google Cloud with GPUs, TPUs, and you know, the real powerful computational resources. So the biggest point is don't start with the model. That's something I see people doing wrong out of school all the time. You have to kind of start at a higher level. Great. Thanks, Lee, for the uh, for the clarifies. I think, you know, that's actually for many of us, actually, you know, think about the machine learning, talk about the models, models, models. Actually, underneath the models, the data is more, even more important. Uh, and I think that's also the uh, Andrew in, in uh, he is kind of like a strong push from like a model centric machine learning to the data centric machine learnings. Uh, and also as uh, uh, Vikram, uh, he mentioned about uh, this, you know, 70 or 80 percent of the uh, machine learning engineers or data scientists, their job is spending on the data. So actually the next question is come to Lean for you. So uh, on the GCPs, uh, what kind of like the uh, uh, service they offering for specifically for processing data? So, like I remember before, I running a lot of uh, you know Spark or you know the other uh, data processing uh, workload uh, in other place. Uh, so how about uh, like GCPs on the GCPs? Any um, you know like a data processing service uh, to make the uh, developers the engineers? Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. They all start with data, data flow, data proc, data this, data that. Um, but I'll tell you the one that most people are going to use for big data processing is data proc, which is Apache Spark at scale. And the Google implementation is extremely elegant. The, um, it's PaaS, so the VMs uh, spin up and you have full access to uh, a, a VM image that's tuned for a high performance Spark. And I mean, it's my go-to for Spark because it's, it's price performant, and uh, it has all the tooling that you need and Google is constantly improving the offering. Um, so Spark is for me, the core of the workload. Now there's other types of data processing available. I mean, obviously you're gonna use something like BigQuery for more traditional data warehousing. Um, and that's serverless by the way too, which is actually my favorite service. Mm -hmm. BigQuery has gotta be everybody's favorite service. It's like the best service. It's serverless. Yeah, serverless SQL is what it is, if you've never tried it out. So you pay by the query and it's designed for aggregate workloads. Um, you know, again, Google uh, really has a suite of products. You know, it has some specialty things like Apache Airflow, which I can't remember what the name of the service is, but they, they basically take the, open, yeah, they take the open source libraries and they optimize them. But um, again, because of time, I can't go over all of it. I'll just, I'll just say that for many, many things, you know, you're going to have your relational database, which is Cloud SQL or Spanner, but Sp Spanner is if you're solving a, a Google scale problem. So Spanner is a specialty. You know, there aren't too many Googles in the world. So most people use Cloud SQL. There's BigQuery, which basically every customer uses. That's for reporting, data warehousing. And then more and more, my customers are using Dataproc. So those are the three core. And I maybe it's different from you guys. Victor, we've been talking so much. Maybe you should have something to add here. Yeah, sure. I mean, so I don't write any models, I don't build models myself, but we support a bunch of infrastructure that helps, uh, you know, machine learning experts write, build these models. 
So the, the two that we use um, frequently, uh, that we support frequently are, um, one is um, AI notebooks, right? So uh, sometimes uh, data scientists and ML folks don't, uh, they, they need to do a lot of experimentation, right? And um, they don't necessarily want to manage a GCE node or they need more resources that are beyond their local laptop or whatever. Right? So AI Notebooks is a really nice service where they can just bring up a compute engine instance that's dedicated to just them. Uh, and it's got all of the various, they can choose various images, uh, base images that already have tools that they, they're using, like TensorFlow, you know, particular versions of dependencies, R, um, whatever it happens to be, Google has already made a bunch of images for pre-installed versions and everything already works. You don't have to figure out how to make this, you know, one particular package work with another particular package, it's already been blessed. Uh, and so uh, a, a, a data scientist or an ML person can just launch an instance, do their experimentation, write their code, uh, you know, use their Jupyter Net, uh, notebook and help, you know, figure out what they want to write. And once it's ready to be run at scale, uh, typically then they'll deploy this code uh, into uh, a Google uh, Cloud Composer which is Google's uh, Apache Airflow managed service. Um, and Composer actually runs Airflow on top of Kubernetes engine, GKE. So you get all of the power and scaling of GKE uh, and you get the, um, you can use your existing Airflow uh, DAGs that you've already written. Uh, and you can still reference things, talk to other Google services like BigQuery, pull data from Google Cloud Storage, uh, and then, you know, uh, output out to BigQuery again, or Google Cloud Storage again. Uh, and it's uh, Airflow that's managed for you. It just happens to be using GKE under the covers to do a lot of the automation and scale. Um, and so, yeah, we've had a lot of success with Composer uh, because Com Airflow itself, which is managed, uh, which is what Composer is managing, is kind of cumbersome to kind of set up and, and run, uh, especially on cloud. And so Composer is just a great service that like figures out all the details for you. And so it's just like another step towards making it easier for engineers to do what they really care about, which is, you know, building these models and not necessarily figuring out the networking and infrastructure bits. Yeah, great. one last so, thing thanks. I want to add in there. Look, Sorry, just please the last thing I want to add. You probably don't yeah. have enough data. You probably don't have enough data to think about big data solutions. Yeah, like Lynn works with big data. You probably don't work with big data. <laughs> I generally don't work with like... So, so, so big, big, big data is like ter terabytes per day. Terabytes. Ter yeah, terabytes. unless you have that scale, yeah. don't yeah. think about that's, it. That's that. Yeah, that's a good point, Vikram. <laughs> good. Okay, great. Uh, we have uh, two or three minutes uh, left, so I want to come to the last questions. So, so uh, I mean, before we talk about all of the exciting about the cloud, you know, uh, the good things about them. So I want to each of you think, give probably one example about uh, uh, like some of the uh, important but uh, uh, easily overlooked perspective on the cloud. So, you know, some things you probably should uh, think about it before you get started to avoid uh, some pitfalls and you know like shooting yourself in the uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the foot yeah. so. so 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 i'll start so um cost um so although google cloud is a very price performant you always want to um you know be aware of what the services cost it's a very generous free tier um but you want to put up budget alerts and you want to pay attention to what things cost and it, you know when you're not using something pause it or turn it off um have some control around it and one thing i do want to get in because i've just seen so many questions about learning more in my world, in addition to um, uh, building, I also have over a hundred different resources on GitHub. Most of them are completely free. Some of them are tied to some courses on LinkedIn Learning, but it's um, my name on GitHub and it's learning hyphen cloud. And I've got courses on machine learning. I've got courses on GCP essentials. I have a course um, GCP for bioinformatics that I'm particularly proud of. That's completely open source. So as people are learning more about cost control and other gotchas, um, please do go and make use of my free resources on GitHub because I, whenever I learn something, I try to share it and that's where I put it. 
and it's my name is my GitHub um, uh, organization. Yeah, I'll, uh, uh, you know, one thing that gets overlooked is, um, uh, as I yeah, mentioned, like, is, is cost and, and, uh, and security, right? So um, I'll tell a little story recently. Um, so at my company, CloudKite, we give uh, 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 interviewees a GCP account that's blank. They get full owner access and they can do whatever they want. Um, and we've done this dozens of times, never been an issue. Uh, a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, this is pretty recent, a, um, a candidate uh, checked in some um, GCP credentials, right? And you hear about these all the time and I've always like kind of just laughed it off. It'll never happen to me. Uh, and this time it happened to me in my, in my company, right? And so I can checked in some GCP credentials. It happened to be on a Friday. Um, I got a, you know, Git, GitHub tells Google that there's a GitHub program that automatically scans for credentials. And they tell Google that, hey, you've committed, uh, somebody uh, has committed credentials that are part of your org. Um, and so I got the email, but then the candidate sent me an email saying he took care of it. And I was like, okay, great. He took care of it. I don't have to worry about it. Turns out he didn't actually fully take care of it. Uh, and uh, by Monday, uh, every single region that that account had access to, which was all of them because it fell under the CloudKite uh, account, we have all limits turned off because we use a lot of cloud resource, computing resources. He, uh, somebody had managed to grab the credentials from GitHub uh, and, spin, and spun up to, uh, 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 GPU instances everywhere mining cryptocurrency. So we had a uh, six figure bill uh, from from Google as a, you know within a couple of days, um, but you know thankfully uh, Google understood and uh, you know they, some, somebody uh, took care of the bill for us. And, uh, that's that's my lesson. So pay more attention to the security emails uh, because even though somebody you know, we, we we removed the credentials, but that the credentials were leaked long enough just that the attacker managed to create new credentials that were not removed. So um, they, they don't always use the ones that are committed. That was, that was my lesson. Great. Uh, Vikram, you have 10 seconds, so maybe if you have yeah. any uh, right? My lesson is actually like, don't go overboard. Like your problems might be solved by simpler solutions. Don't go overboard. Think about simpler solutions. And uh, that is the only advice that I could give to anybody. <laughs> Great, yeah. thanks. I think that's the, you know, the, 10 seconds a great suggestions for everybody else. well thanks a lot thanks uh, you know lee and uh, vikram and victor for the great sharing and uh, thank you very much for, for, for uh